Hello everyone and welcome to the Winecast. As you can see, this cast is going to tackle German wine classification. And I know some of you have already got it into your head somehow that German classifications and German wine labels for that matter are complicated affairs full of funny sounding long words with lots of consonants. Well, if that's your impression, you'd be right about that. German wine classification is complicated, but like most things German, it's definitely got its own internal logic. And once you get the hang of it, you'll be navigating it like a pro in no time. Still, there's a lot of classification to get through, and that does mean that, wait for it, I'm going to have to divide this cast into two parts. Yep, two parts. Trust me, you'll thank me by the time we get to the end of this part. And anyway, just think of the reams of stuff that you're going to learn. You'll be the envy of all your wine drinking friends, most of whom don't know this stuff either, and you might even impress some Germans. So let's get started. The biggest single thing that stands behind the current system in Germany was the wine law reform of 1971, which was a pretty big deal, decades in the making actually. It was also coming from a pretty clear ideological point of view, one that had a decidedly anti-elitist bent to it. The framers of the 1971 law didn't want the situation that they saw in some other European countries, I don't want to name any names, France, where you f if you found yourself in possession of a prime vineyard site, either through inheritance or purchase, you essentially had a license to print money and could charge astronomical amounts for the grapes that you grew and for the wines made from them. Instead, they wanted any wine grower anywhere in Germany to at least theoretically be able to create top quality wines. The way the law tried to achieve this was by de-emphasizing the concept of terroir or any kind of focus on where the grapes were from and focusing instead on how ripe in terms of sugar content a producer could get his grapes. The focus on sugar ripeness actually made a kind of sense in context. Most of Germany's wine growing regions were the very northern end of where you could successfully grow grapes in 1971. And in conditions like that, there was a correlation between being able to get your grapes ripe and being able to produce quality wine, though a lot has changed since the early 1970s. The system did allow for some geographic identification of vineyard sites, but did so in a way that arguably left consumers more confused than they were before the reform. Finally, in 2009, this system had to be harmonized with, or maybe shoehorned into, the EU's classification framework, and that created its own set of issues. As you might know from other wine casts, the EU uses a three-tiered system that starts with a largely unregulated bottom, or wine tier, for the production of low-quality bulk wine, and on top of that rests a protected geographic indication, or PGI tier, with slightly more regulation, but still a pretty freewheeling spot where innovative wine producers like to park their barrels so they can experiment away from the strict regulations on the topmost quality tier, the PDO, or protected designation of origin tier. The post-2009 German system seems like it fits perfectly onto the EU system, but it's important to note two big differences. First, even the highest level of the quality pyramid isn't particularly heavily regulated in terms of grape growing or winemaking practices. In fact, the German system feels a lot more like the American system that has almost no strictures on how you grow your grapes or what you can do with them than it does like other major European wine producers, France, Italy, and Spain. Second, though there are different geographic indications for the German equivalents of the PGI and PDO levels, it's important to remember that any vineyard could produce wine at any level in the classification, depending on how ripe the grapes were when they were picked. These two facts lead to another difference between the German wine industry and those of other European countries. And that's that the lower two tiers of the pyramid in Germany are not where innovative quality producers like to hang out as they might in France, Italy, or Spain. Remember, the top tier is almost as unregulated as the lower tiers are, so there's a lot of room to experiment up there, and the only big concern is getting the grapes ripe. In fact, the lower two tiers of Germany's pyramid account for less than 5% of Germany's total wine production, and almost all of that is consumed at home. Let's have a look at these levels. The bottom tier, known as the Vine or Wine tier, was called Toffel Vine before 2009. There's a low requirement for ripeness that growers must meet to make grapes into wine at this tier, and if the winemaker is concerned that grapes at this level of ripeness won't give her the alcohol levels that she wants for her wine, she has the option of chaptalizing, or adding sugar to the unfermented juice to boost alcohol levels in the finished wine. 
If the wine is chaptalized, it has to be fermented until it's completely dry or all the sugar has been turned into alcohol. And then the winemaker can add sous reserva or unfermented grape juice that's usually very sweet back into the finished wine to round it out and sweeten it. Usually, though, imported bulk wine, mostly from Italy, is blended in to round out wines at this tier. But if the wine was made from all German grapes, it can call itself Deutscher Wein. As I said before, there's not a lot of expectation for quality at this tier. The next tier up is called Geschützte Geografische Angabe, or GGA for short, and the phrase means Protected Geographic Specification. Prior to 2009, this tier was called Landwein, or Country Wine, and what mostly sets it apart from the vine tier is a slightly higher requirement for ripeness at harvest in the grapes. As at the lower tier, chaptalization is permitted. You can see the influence of the EU system and the requirement that 85% of the grapes for a wine made at this tier be from one of the 19 possible Landwein regions in Germany. As with the vine tier, the expectations for quality here remain quite low. Where things begin to get a little more interesting is in the top tier of the pyramid, the level called Geschützte Ursprungsbezeichnung. The phrase is a pretty literal translation of protected designation of origin, and this category was created in 2009 to house two pre-existing categories, Qualitätswein bestimmter Anbaugebiete, or QBA, and Prädikatswein. All wines made at this level, in either subcategory, must show the place name of one of 13 specified wine growing regions, or Anbaugebiete, and all of the grapes in the wine must come from the region shown. Let's look at these two subcategories individually. They form a pyramid within a pyramid, so to speak, and the base of the pyramid is called Qualitätswein bestimmter Anbaugebiete, or quality wine from specified growing areas. There are 13 Anbaugebiete, or specified growing regions, mostly in the south and west parts of Germany, each of which has its own standards for what varietals can be used and for what ripeness level the grapes need to attain at harvest. The standards for ripeness are high relative to the standards for vine and the GGA level wines, but it's still okay to chaptalize these wines if the producer feels it's necessary. This tier produces the majority of German wines. In some years, as much as 75% of total German output comes from this tier. Now let's go back to the sub-pyramid and look specifically at the very top tier, Prädikatswein. The German word Prädikat is cognate with the English word predicate and means something like a quality in the sense of an attribute. So Prädikatswein means something like wine with a particular attribute. Like Qualitätswein, all of the grapes must come from a particular Anbaugebiet, or growing region, that has its own standards for ripeness and permitted varietals. The ripeness standards that each Anbaugebiet will have to produce Prädikatswein, though, will be higher than its standards for Qualitätswein, and chaptalization is not permitted if you want to produce a wine that will be designated a Prädikatswein. Once grape ripeness passes the threshold for Prädikatswein, the wine will be assigned a final designation out of six possible attributes, or Prädikata, based on by how much the ripeness went beyond the required threshold. Here's yet another sub-pyramid, this time of the Prädikatswein tier, showing the different levels, attributes, Prädikata that the grapes can be assigned to. Starting with Cabinet at the base of the sub-pyramid, Grapes at this level have met the minimum standard for ripeness for inclusion in the Prädikatswein tier. The name comes from the cabinet that wine merchants would usually keep their good stuff in, as opposed to the lesser quality offerings that would be on the shelves. A cabinet can be vinified from noticeably sweet to dry, and at their best have a light, crisp quality to them, though some examples, particularly when made from Riesling, can be very complex. As we move up the sub-pyramid, the standards for ripeness sugar content in the grapes go up with each level, but you also start to see some particular stylistic elements appear in each of the wines, and despite the hierarchical structure of this classification, it's best not to think of wines at the upper levels of this pyramid as being inherently better than wines at the lower levels, and instead to focus on their stylistic differences. Spätlesen are made from grapes picked after the designated harvest date, hence late harvest. 
a lot of these wines are made off dry to sweet, but they're excellent medium and fully dry examples. Well-made Spätlesen can age for a couple of decades and usually have rich, complex fruit when they're young and more mineral qualities as they age. Grapes for Auslese, or Harvest Select wines, have higher sugar levels still and are also picked after harvest, usually well after harvest. These wines can be made in any style from dry to medium dry to off dry to sweet, but sweet tends to rule the roost. You can also find Auslesen that have some exposure to Botrytis, the fungus known also as noble rot that can give white grapes a honeyed flavor. Though at this level it will usually only appear as a touch of Botrytis and the honeyed quality won't dominate the flavor profile. At the barren Auslese or BA level, the ripest berries are often selected and harvested individually to then make this wine. The style for barren Auslese is always sweet, and while it's possible to make dry wines from grapes at this ripeness level, wines like that are usually deliberately declassified to the Auslesen or QBA levels because of consumer expectations for sweetness in BA wines. Though not all vintages have Botrytis, it can be a more dominant player in the flavor profile at this and the next level up as well. Trockenbaren Auslese wines are made from individually harvested grapes with extraordinarily high sugar levels that have dried to some degree on the vine, sometimes almost to the point of becoming raisins. The style is always intensely sweet and complex. Finally, grapes at the BA and TBA levels of sweetness, if they're not affected by botrytis, can be left to hang until they freeze, and if picked and pressed while frozen, the water in them will separate from the must as ice and then can be discarded, further intensifying the flavors. The resulting wine is called an ice vine, and while many different grapes can be used to produce wines at all the different praticata on this scale, including ice wines, Riesling really rules the roost for this category, and in Germany at least makes the best regarded examples of ice vines. So, with all of the focus on sugar ripeness and sugar levels in grapes, should you assume that all quality German wine is sweet? The answer to that would be a pretty firm no. And we've already seen how wines at every level of quality, except for maybe Trockenbären, Auslese, and Eiswein, can be made dry. In fact, two-thirds of all German wine is dry, and producers will usually label a truly dry wine with the word Trocken. Still, many wines, especially at the Prydekat level that aren't truly dry, aren't necessarily intensely sweet either, and it can be a challenge figuring out just how sweet or not they are, since intermediate degrees of sweetness won't usually be consistently labeled. If there isn't some helpful information on the label, and there might be, a handy trick to use is to have a gander at the alcohol by volume of the wine that will be listed on the label. Remember that during fermentation, yeast consumes sugar and produce alcohol. So sugar levels drop while alcohol levels go up. And a dry wine is a wine that's had all of the sugar and the juice fermented out and made into alcohol. Broadly speaking, wines made from grapes harvested at the ripeness levels for Cabinet, Spätlese, and Auslese have enough sugar to produce a finished wine with 10, 12, and 14% alcohol by volume respectively if the wine were fermented all the way to dryness. So, a Spätlese, for example, that could have produced 12% alcohol, but only ended up with 8% alcohol, is going to have a lot of sugar left over, what we call residual sugar, that wasn't fermented out, and the resulting wine will be quite sweet. So the general rule is, the higher up the Praedicata scale the wine is, and the lower the alcohol count, the sweeter the wine will be. As alcohol levels go up, sweetness will go down. This is also a good trick to use when looking at New World wines that can sometimes be left off dry or sweet, like a New World Riesling or a Gewurztraminer. If the grapes are from a warm climate area like Washington, California, or Australia, assume that the grapes reached Spätlese levels of ripeness or more, even if they were picked at harvest time. All right, that was a lot of Germany as promised. So thank you for joining me for this wine cast and for sticking with me throughout it. Please join me for the second half of this wine cast, where we're going to talk about some geographic indications on German labels and what they mean, and also talk about some alternate means of classification that try to make better sense out of German wine in a modern context than the 1971 wine law could.
Please like or subscribe if this cast was helpful or interesting to you. I'm your host, The Unknown Winecaster, and I'm out. Always enjoy the grape, but always enjoy it responsibly.